Okay, hopefully you're here because you're a JavaScript developer. So you're familiar with building things for the web, maybe building things on the server side in Node, but you don't know how to build hardware. What I want to do today is show you that with the existing JavaScript knowledge you've got, some off-the-shelf components and a couple of libraries from NPM, you can immediately start building useful, interesting devices. We're going to do a bit of live demos for this. I've got some live coding, some live electronics. Uh, all of this is a bit fragile, so we'll see what explodes when, and let's just bear with that a little bit. Um, I'd like to dive straight in, but unfortunately, I don't have a slide clicker. So the first thing we're going to do is build one. I'm going to do that with this. This is a Metaware C. We'll talk a little bit more about it in a second. But the important things are that it has Bluetooth and a button. Um, what that means is we can write some code that listens for the button and then simulates key presses on my laptop to go through to the next slide. And that's what we're going to do right here. I've got a couple of modules already imported. Maybe let's get a bit bigger. How's that? Everybody happy? Yeah. Great. So um, let's do some setup. Firstly, this is Bluetooth. So we need to actually connect to our device. So I want to search for devices. Um, and set that up. And I'm actually going to wrap this in a function <coughs> uh, that I will call straight away for reasons that will make sense a little bit later. Cool. So we do a Bluetooth scan and we find our device. Let's actually log that so we know what's going on. Found device.id. Great. Now we've got a device, so we want to connect to it. So that looks like this. And this is a kind of classic node style callback. So we need to check if we've got an error. And if we do log about it and uh, just retry, why not? And then give up. Um, so we connect. And hopefully, at this point, by the time we've got to this code, we've done everything that's required to find this device, connect to it, and start listening for events. So what events can we actually get? Here, we want the button. So that looks like this. Let button equals new. It's on switch device. This API is a bit weird, to be honest, but it works. So that's great. Uh, we have to actually explicitly opt in to getting button events. For a lot of devices like this, you'll find that they don't broadcast every event. They're very low power devices. So you have to individually turn on the sensors you want to hear about. And once we've got this actual button, we say, great, when I get any kind of pressed event coming through here, check. And if it's just been lifted up, so we get pressed events for button down and up, then let's log pressed. And let's use um, this library I've got here, which just simulates me pressing right on the keyboard. Um, the other thing I'm going to want is if at any point this goes horribly wrong and the device gets disconnected, um, warn me about it, and then just try again and hope that it comes back. Uh, blog disconnected. Right. So we've built, hopefully, fingers crossed, we've built a slide clicker in 35 lines here. And if I confidently hop over here and run this, it's going to start scanning for Bluetooth devices around. And the library knows how to recognize these specific Metaware devices. So we should see this pop up in a sec. Except it's not going to, which is not a great start. It's definitely not going to. What's going on there? So I discover how to pass it. Damn it. Any takers? Ah, there we go. OK, it just took a second. So that's found it, and it's connected, and it's now talking to this device. Wonderful. So in principle, I should be able to press this button. Where is the button? Press this button, and hop straight through to the next slide. <laughs> So, do you remember that first bit when you were learning JavaScript, when you were starting to build web pages, for example? You put together some HTML, some little bits of interesting things, and suddenly you've got scrolling text, you've got blinking lights. This is amazing. This is really cool. The internet stops being something that you just see and becomes something you can change, something you can make, and something you can understand, something that you can really be part of with that little bit of knowledge that you've picked up. You can get that exact same experience with hardware. In a couple of minutes, you can build interesting, useful gadgets with a couple of easy libraries and standard off-the-shelf components. So uh, what is this? 
The Metal SC is a microcontroller <laughs> on a board with a bunch of sensors um, and Bluetooth and so on as well. Uh, so we've got a button here, obviously, but also an accelerometer and a gyroscope so we can tell when you're moving around and when you're turning it. So you can measure temperature on here. We've got GPIO pins, which we'll talk a bit more about later. So in principle, you could attach extra components on top of this. And the whole thing runs on a watch battery. So it uses very, very little power and will last a very long time on that. This is a reasonably expensive version of this kind of thing. I think these come at about $50. You can get cheaper ones that look a bit less cool, like the Nordic thingy, which comes in at about $30. Um, and all of these let you immediately start adding sensing and physical connections to the code you're running on your computer. You can run JavaScript that reaches out from your machine and it's interacting with the physical world around it. So what can we actually do with this? A couple of easy ideas to get started with. You can do things like just add sensing to your environment. When I sit up from my chair, attach one of these to the bottom of your chair, detect the motion. When I sit up, lock my computer. When I sit down, prompt me for a password. You can just start tying in that extra bit of interactivity to anything you like around you. You can do the same kind of thing, pushing notifications out. Attach a buzzer to this, or just blink the LEDs on this. And you can start pushing notifications from your computer directly to your wrist, or anywhere else you'd like nearby. These are pretty neat. Uh, this is quite cool. It's an easy way of getting started. They're also very basic. And you can't really directly extend this very well. In principle, you can write your own firmware for this, but that's quite hard, and it's not JavaScript. Um, you can attach your own components, but it's a bit tricky in places. What you need if you want to get into this further is a hardware board that gives you closer, more direct, low-level access to the hardware. So we want to actually get a bit more low-level here and dig in. I'm going to do that over here with an Arduino. Um, so uh, this is the Arduino Uno. It's a fantastic bit of kit for getting started with low-level electronics. It is a very, very, very terrible computer. This has two kilobytes of RAM. It's running an 8-bit processor that I think is about 16 megahertz, something like that. Uh, you've got 32 kilobytes of storage in total. You cannot do anything remotely similar to what you're used to on a machine with this. But that also makes it perfect for electronics. It means you have no distractions. You have no operating systems. Nothing else is running except your code. You can directly control exactly what's going on here. All right, so actually do that control, we're going to use these pins down the side. So if we take a closer look at these, like a lot of hardware like this you'll find has little labels saying exactly what these pins do. For all of the things we're going to be looking at, so the Arduino and the Pies I've got here as well, each of these pins have slightly different purposes. And when you're trying to build hardware here, you want to think about which pins you're connecting up. So on the left here, we've got power. So these are pins that give you a constant voltage out or provide a ground. And they do nothing dynamic at all, but fixed constant power. We've got analog read. So this can read a varying voltage. So when you read from this in code, you're going to get a number between 0 and 1023 for the Arduino, I think. Uh, and that's going to tell you some changing value. So if you've got a dial you're changing, a temperature sensor, or a light sensor, or something, you can plug those wires into these pins, and you can read those varying voltages out. On the other side, we've got digital read and write pins, um, which uh, let you write and read constant values. And some of these can also do analog values here and there. So here we can say, is this pin on or off? <coughs> but we can't tell between that point. And we can turn pins on and off. And some of these do analog write with something called PWM, pulse, pulse width modulation which means they switch extremely quickly from high to low to simulate a value in between. But for most stuff, that works for kind of simulating a, a middling voltage. So this lets you control things with varying speeds, like motors. <coughs> the other thing you're going to need if you want to start building electronics for this sort of stuff is a breadboard. If you've never used a breadboard, they look kind of opaque, scary, and mysterious. They're actually very simple. You've got all these holes here. They're connected together like so. Um, what happens is that you have two rails across the top, which by convention get used for power and ground. And those are connected together right the way along. And then each set of five pins within here are all connected together so that you can slot components into one and connect up further along. And this avoids you just 
directly wiring together a mass of electronics on your desk that slowly forms an impossible to understand ball and instead gives you a slightly more possible to understand mess of electronics. It still gets pretty bad quite quickly, but this gives you some structure within to work, within which to work. So let's do some actual electronics here. I've got an Arduino down in this corner. We're going to try and build this very basic fixed circuit. So this uses the constant 5 volt out, runs it along the power rail through a resistor, through an LED, and back along the ground rail into the ground pin. And the Arduino just provides a constant voltage out on that, which will bring this circuit together. Um, I'm going to actually do that over here. You might be able to, if you're in the front row, you can probably see. Hopefully, you can get an idea from up there as well. <coughs> so let's see how this goes. We take a resistor. We wire it up to one of those rows, just like that. Take the LED, put it into the same row, and also into the ground. And just like that, we've got a little lit up LED. We can do simple, constant, fixed electronics with this. If you've ever done any electronics um, in some classes or in school or something, it'll be, you will have seen this kind of thing before. This, as you may have noticed, is not JavaScript. Uh, so what we want to do is make this dynamic and programmable in some sense. What that means is that we need to change from the 5 volt pin to a pin we can write to, which looks like this. So this is a very easy change. We move from that fixed 5 volt to pin 8, which we can write to. It's a digital write pin. So let's take a look at that. We unplug here, and we plug in over there. Simple, easy. And then we want to actually write some code that uses this. To do that, we're going to use a library called Johnny5. If you're doing any kind of low-level electronics like this, uh, you're going to want to use Johnny5 for JavaScript. It supports Arduinos and a whole list of other, of other boards. So you can do a huge amount of this kind of stuff with it. Um, and it's also really very popular for this, so very easy to find tutorials and examples for. It's the right place to go if you're trying to do exactly this sort of stuff. So to actually write that code, what we need to do is uh, if we want to, say, blink this LED, we need to turn pin 8 on and off over some frequency. And that <coughs> looks like this. We, I've got um, two libraries installed, one Johnny5 and the other is Temporal. Temporal is a timing library for Johnny5. Lots of electronics like this is quite sensitive to specific timing, and things like set timeout and set intermediate that you might be used to have some gotchas if you're trying to use them for this sort of thing. So. Um, what we're going to do is use temporal, which directly takes control of timing and sorts out some of those details. The actual way that this code is going to run is not on this board. This board has only two kilobytes of memory, which, as you may have noticed, if you run Chrome, is not enough to run a JavaScript <laughs> engine. Um, what the, uh, the Arduino does have is some standard firmware that exposes the full normal C API, effectively, over the wire. So we can write exactly the same commands you would write if you were putting firmware on the device and run them remotely from this laptop. But we could also put that onto a Raspberry Pi and have a Raspberry Pi controlling Arduinos around it or anything else like this. And you can directly translate this code into C, pretty much, and then put it on the board autonomously if you'd like to. So um, what does that look like? That looks like this. We need to wait for the boards to become ready, firstly. Um, so this means that we've connected to it over the USB. We then need to go uh, and grab the actual pin. So we want to get pin 8. That's the one we're looking at. And then we're going to use temporal to uh, do the timing logic for this. So every second, I want to turn the pin on. And then half a second later, turn the pin off. And that is hopefully going to give me a blinking LED. Just like that. So we write this code. Probably looks fine, right? Let's try it. Um, coming over here, if we go to Next.js, so this starts up, it connects. And if we hop back over here, you can see, hopefully, we have a blinking LED. <laughs> and you can start writing JavaScript that directly controls bits of electronics. So an LED is the simplest example, but there's all sorts of other pieces and things that you can start building on here. And there's a lot of tutorials and guides around the electronics part of Arduinos and how to take that further. Uh, let's go for one more example here and try and actually read in. Let's 
going on here? Uh, read in the some input. So to do this, we're going to use a photoresistor. A photoresistor is a resistor that changes its resistance depending on the amount of light. One thing to watch out for is that you might think you just run voltage out through this resistor and into your analog read pins and then read that. The, those pins measure voltage, not resistance. And if you want to get the voltage to change as the resistance changes, you have to do a slightly fiddly circuit here. What happens is that constant voltage goes out and then through the photoresistor, and then the circuit splits. And half of it goes back through a resistor and into the ground, and the other half goes into the analog pin. And the ratio of the resistances is what changes the voltage there. You don't really need to understand the details of this, but there's a lot of like, standard guides and things that will help you get started with this without too much trouble. Um, so we want to move to constant voltage. Constant voltage. We want to have a photo. <laughs> Ooh, that's interesting. What's going on there? <laughs> I'm just going to ignore that problem for a second. <laughs> um, I really have no idea. <laughs> that's very odd. OK. Yeah, this is really annoying. Let's have a quick poke at it. What happens if I just change to this nice webcam and you can see my smiling face? Uh, and then we change back. Do you think that magically fixes it? It does. Great. Um, so we've got a photoresistor now set up here, and we want to split the circuit so that half goes back to our analog read pin, A0, over here. And the other half goes through this resistor. Um, there, come on. In there and back into ground. So we've effectively built that circuit we were looking at a second ago. And if we change this code, we can start reading those values. So let's say that every half a second, I want to read the pin. So pin query state console.log uh, state.value. And this will tell me what it's currently seeing. I need to change that pin to be A0, which is the pin we're using to read in. So with this, we should now be able to actually start reading the light measurements that we're getting over here. So we should see a stream of numbers. There you go. And if I cover this, you can see those go down. These, this is, looks like it's varying between about 50 and 200. You can calibrate the exact range you get there by changing the other resistor, because it's looking at the ratio between the two. I um, mean, you can sit and tweak this however you like. But with this now, you can start writing applications are aware of light and things going on around them. You can attach all sorts of other sensors and a huge amount of other similar stuff here. Electronics is a big topic, so I can't really summarize all of it. Um, there's loads of guides. <laughs> the Arduino is really good for this kind of thing because there are so many guides on how to get started with this. Um, and quite a lot of them using Node, and nodeardx.org is particularly good for that kind of thing. Um, if you want some specific ideas, uh, plant waterers are really popular. So you can get uh, moisture sensors, which are effectively resistors that change resistance depending on the moisture. Stick one of those in the soil, get a pump that you can control, and directly hook it up. When the moisture drops below this point, turn the pump on until it comes back up. You can start building simple, useful electronics in your life like this. Um, one that I quite like is this project I found on the, on the internet for automating inbox zero. Uh, this is a circuit a little bit more complicated than the ones we've seen, but not a lot. <laughs> this on the right here is a switch. What this does is amazing. If you hold down this button, one yellow light turns on. The second yellow light turns on. The red light starts blinking, and then it deletes all your unread emails. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> So Arduinos are pretty cool. We can build useful, interesting hardware here, and you can directly start attaching lots of uh, devices without any distractions. But they're also quite limiting. If you want to do anything really with internet directly on this board, if you want to be thinking about video or Bluetooth, there are sort of ways you can make that work, but it's really hard on an Arduino. You don't have the power to usefully do that. Uh, what you need is something a bit more powerful, like a Raspberry Pi. You've probably heard of Raspberry Pis at some point. This is the Raspberry Pi 3. Um, it has a 1.2 gigahertz processor. It's a 64-bit processor, although it is ARM. Um, you've got a gigabyte of RAM. You've got as much storage as you can fit on an SD card. So that's a gig here. You've got 
network, USB, uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, HDMI. You've still got a huge array of pins that you can do low-level hardware with. Uh, and because this is a real computer, we can run JavaScript on the board directly. This gives us a lot of cool stuff. Uh, what I've got set up here is three cameras. Um, I'm not actually sure whether the Wi-Fi is going to support this very well. So let's see how we get on. Uh, but what we should be able to do is connect to this and see some interesting things going on. I'm going to try just connecting directly and hope that, oh, hope that that's going to work. If I go like this, cool. So for example, I've got one webcam pointing over here at you, lovely lot. Um, I've got another one. Where's this? Whoop, over here. Um, pointing at you. <laughs> uh, and a third one that might be out of action until we set it up in a sec, uh, which is out of action, yes, but pointing out the window. And that's these three pies here. They've got cameras connected to them. They're on some slightly dubious Wi-Fi running through my phone to make all of this work. Um, and they're running JavaScript just enough JavaScript to make this work. The code for that um, it actually is quite simple. It's 40 lines in total. I'm not going to try and write this out from scratch. But if you're familiar with Express particularly, it's relatively easy to follow. And there is a link in the slides, which I'll send out later, so you can have a proper look through this. We've got an HTML page that connects <laughs> to the server and just streams frames of video and uses a library called Broadway to render them. Um, and we've got a WebSocket endpoint if you connect to it. We send you the details of the video, we connect to the camera on the Pi, and then every time we get some video from the camera, we send it directly to the page, which renders it. That's pretty much the whole thing. And with that much code, we immediately get interesting, useful devices. A internet-connected webcam is a kind of cool, interesting gadget that you can build in 40 lines of JavaScript and will run autonomously. Um, let's imagine we want to extend this a bit further. So what I'd like to do is hook up some actual hardware like th to this in the same way we've been looking at with the Arduino. For the Pi, um, there's a lot of hats which make this a lot easier. Things like this. This is an Enviro hat uh, which comes with a barometer, light and colour, motion sensors, a bunch of other things. And most importantly, has a pre-built connector for the 40 pins on a Pi. So you can just click it straight in and immediately get it working without having to do any of this messy circuitry stuff. Um, what I would like to look at today is the Blinked. So this is an array of eight LEDs, individually controllable for brightness and color, that click directly onto the Pi. So we can take this, we can just lean over here and jam that on there, just like that. And with this, now we can start actually controlling these. So let me take a look at that. Um, so we've got a library for this called Node Blinked, which I've helpfully pre-installed. Uh, so first we load Node Blinked. Then we need to actually get our LEDs. So LEDs are new blinked. Um, we need to set them up. So much like the metaware, you need to kind of register things and prep them. And then we're just going to set <coughs> all the pixels to be really white, maximum brightness. Um, and actually update that. And then after a second, we're going to turn them all off again. So what I'd like is to just blink all these LEDs. Uh, so clear all and send update. This is going to be the bit where the Wi-Fi fails me. Um, that doesn't look promising. Um, <laughs> let's try this and see. Oh, in fact, it's probably going to work better if I have the actual IP for this device, which is not you, uh, which is over here. Uh, oh, no, OK, we're connected. We'll see how this goes. Um, so how do we actually deploy this? So deployment is a complicated topic for the Pi. Um, Arduinos are nice because they don't have any distractions. You can just put software on them and you're done. There's nothing else going on. Deploying to a Pi is much like deploying to any other Linux machine. It's like managing servers, but your servers are tiny, unstable. People keep pulling the network out or the power out. Um, and they're running on SD cards, which corrupt quite easily. 
Um, and all, managing all of this yourself, even without that, is quite a hassle. You don't want to flash your own SD cards. You have to think about things like OS configuration from scratch. Um, lots of native code will not work directly. This is a different processor architecture. Any native binaries that run on your machine will not run on the Pi. So you can't just copy things across, and you need to do your NPM install on the device, for example. And then you need to actually get your code there. It would be nice if, much as with web servers, you didn't just do this whole thing by SSHing in and making it work, and then the Pi breaks, and you have to do that all from scratch. And it'd be nice to be able to monitor these and hopefully do all of this in a secure way. As you may have heard, security in IoT is a big topic. Um, it is hard, and when you try and do all of this stuff from scratch, you make it a lot harder. So um, at Resin, we tend to do this with Docker. Who here has used Docker? Uh, it's pretty good, maybe 50%. Um, the essentials of Docker are fairly simple. You build images. Uh, so you have a Docker file, which defines a series of steps, like take all these files, run npm install, um, and that builds an image a fixed, defined state of all the files you have, uh, all their permissions, what's going on in a system. And you can then distribute that between machines. You can send that to a machine. You can start that up as a container, run it for a while, and then kill it and restart it and get exactly the same thing again extremely quickly. So it gives you this kind of reproducible, movable container that does stuff. And this is really useful for this kind of thing. We can build that container once from a declarative definition of what the system looks like, and just immediately push it straight across. Uh, you still need an OS for that. We actually make a free open source operating system for Pies and like 30 other boards that does exactly this. Um, so this is basically a super trimmed down Linux with a trimmed down version of Docker on it, set up and ready to go. So you can just flash this to an SD card, start it up, and then do whatever you like with Docker on there. And there's a command line tool to make that even easier. So you run resin local push. It connects to Docker on here and does your whole build on there. So it solves all the cross-compilation and all that kind of thing, uh, if the Wi-Fi works, which it does not. So we're not going to worry too much about the demo bits of that. Um, I will have all this stuff for the hackathon over the weekend. So if people want to come along and play around with this, we can definitely do that later. Uh, the other bit of this is that once you've got a lot of these pies, you don't individually want to go and update them, and you really want to be able to see what they uh, do remote, are doing remotely, to get logs out and things, to check on your plant waterer when you're away on holiday, all these other important tasks. Um, so we actually make a platform for that. This isn't open source, but it is free if you've got up, and up to 10 devices. So unless you're planning on buying 200 Raspberry Pis, you can just immediately start using it. And that also does builds in the cloud. So building stuff on a Raspberry Pi is OK, but Raspberry Pis are not that powerful. We've got ARM servers on the internet. So you push, it builds once, and then it goes to every Raspberry Pi you have. With this, you can immediately actually start writing this kind of code um, and getting interesting stuff happening on here without having to do the electronics. We can start building neat bits of video, um, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth stuff that happens on these devices, distribute those wherever we like and build interesting hardware just with these little bits of JavaScript, these modules. OK, what can we actually do with this? I think digital photo frames are probably the best possible idea for Raspberry Pis, uh, especially if you're coming from a web background. This is a Linux machine. You can get hats like these that are small TFT screens. So they just click directly onto the top of the device. And then all of a sudden, you've got a computer with a screen. You can just run Chrome or Electron write a web app that runs on there and say, pull all your photos from Facebook and load them as you swipe between them. And you've built a photo frame from scratch with, for like $50. I think the cheapest Pi is $5. You'll spend more on shipping than on buying the Pi. You can build some really quite neat hardware, really, really cheap. And a lot of those kind of projects are basically just web technologies. You get to put the web into the physical world in a quite fun, interesting way. And you can also do things like extending the other projects we've talked about. <laughs> uh, so you can take your plant waterer and you can attach a video to it. So you can check how it's doing on holiday. You can have remotely connected webcams. Uh, you can let, uh, you can remotely water your thing. You can have it check the weather and not water if it's going to rain and so on and so on. There's actually a project online. I've forgotten the name of it. There's a guy who is crowdsourcing the watering of his plant. It's publishing moisture levels um, to a web server constantly. 
and there's a button on the internet and you can vote for whether it should be watered or not. And at the end of every day, it automatically waters it. And this is the kind of thing that really, really easily with a Raspberry Pi, you can just hook up those things and start get started with. So let's recap and wrap this up. Um, we've looked at remote sensors. So there's a bunch of little tiny boards like this that have stuff pre-connected that you can just start using. You can immediately just get your JavaScript reaching out of your laptop and touching the world around it. We've looked a little bit at microcontroller boards like the Arduino, these very, very dumb, simple boards without any operating system or distractions where you can directly control electronics and directly manage circuits. Um, and then single board computers like the Pi, actual real computers that are still small and can directly access hardware where we can directly hook things up and build on top of those. Um, so I will be putting these slides up on Twitter. I'm Pim Terry on Twitter. Um, and there's links all the way through here for these examples. You can go and check these out and run them for yourselves. Um, and I will be here for the hackathon. I've got all this hardware and I think another five pies and a bunch of other bits and pieces as well. Um, I do need them back at the end of the weekend, but you're welcome to just come and play with them, have a go with this kind of stuff as much as you like. So come and grab me. Um, if there's one thing I can leave you with, it's that hardware is really not actually that hard. You can take some little bits of JavaScript. You can, in front of an audience, in a minute, build interesting, useful gadgets. You can take those same skills you know, off-the-shelf hardware and simple NPM modules, and you can build physical devices that give you that same magic of the web in the real world. Thank you very much. <laughs>